here with Jennifer Starsek, joining us all the way from Los Angeles. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, you've yeah. done a lot of incredible stuff, um, but we always like to start at the beginning. Yeah, so um, we'd like to ask you, how did you get your first start in costume designing? Um, and did you start out in fashion design and then go into film? Um, how did it all come about? I have a pretty long trajectory because I had, I'd studied, I went to university and I studied fashion design and concert and costume. And um, just almost immediately after graduating, started to work on my first film and costumes. But, um, and that came about in a very interesting way. I was working with this when we were doing archiving and she was an amazing archivist and we worked at LACMA Museum and at Personal Collections and Galanos, who's like an American couturier. And we were doing all these things and somebody had called her to design a film and she said, I don't do that, but maybe my assistant was interested in it. And I got on the phone with this person. He was like, okay, I need someone with some experience, but you sound like you could, I'll keep your number, which is what he did. So when he hired the costume designer, that costume designer, called me and he just took a chance and we went and designed his first film. And he was sort of where I was maybe a few years ago. And name is George Little, where he had been working in the costume, you know, in the costume capacity, but he wanted to make the transition from, you know, working costumes to actually costume designing. So he couldn't ask any of his friends to work for like the equivalent of like $45 a day. And um, for that film, it was pretty amazing because Brian Cranston had wrote a film for his wife. He'd already been, Malcolm in the Middle fame, but he had end on Breaking Bad fame. And we shot it out in, which is like Palm Desert, which is basically at Pioneer Town, which is the stop, the go-to stop for Coachella performers to perform in. It's like this crazy little cute town that was built in the 40s. And that's where we shot our movie. And Pappy and Harriet's where all these like famous bands play is where caters. And that was like my very first foray into costuming. And shortly afterwards, and he basically like designed it. We went out there, he showed me how to take care of day-to-day -day business and was like, call me if you have any questions and left. So I like, was like sink or swim immediately. And it was just a very quick shoot. It was very, you know, low budget. And a few weeks later, we met back up to wrap up the show. And he was like, what do you think? And I was like, wait, you can do this for a living? Like, and work with these like circus freaks? Like, this is for me. And that's how I started working in costumes. And then I worked everything in costumes, mostly on the prep side. I always did like um, shopping and made to order and fittings. And then I, you know, worked my way up to assistant designing. And then finally somebody, I just needed that right opportunity at the right time. And it's always from people you would never guess that would happen. And a friend of mine, a work friend of mine was like, I can't do this TV show, but I want to put your name in for it. Um, David Fincher's directing it. Would you like to? <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry, what? Like, it was just so insane. And I was like, you're telling me David Fincher's going to meet with me? And she was like, yeah, he's going to meet with you. And I was like, okay. And that, that was my first real costume design opportunity. I had done some smaller things before that but nothing, nothing to that capacity with such a, I mean, esteemed director. I mean, still, that's still starting at the top, no matter what, like it doesn't really matter. Yeah. So. so that's how that came about, which means just always do your best on every job because mm -hmm. someone is paying attention, basically. Mm -hmm. Damn, like, yes. uh, <laughs> damn, <laughs> that's all I can say there. Uh, David Fincher, like, I can't even imagine how that must have felt. Oh, and it was, not even just like, oh, I might be able to get you to work on this, but he wants to meet you or you're going to meet him. That's, I mean, you must have been so nervous. <clears throat> I was, it was an out of body experience to say the least. I first met with his producer who also happens to be his wife, who's just as daunting because they are sort of a force of nature together. And then I passed, you know, that first meeting and then I went to go meet with him and, um, you know, David Fincher's everything you've ever read about. He's the whole, he is an entire package. He's a very unique, like he's one of a kind basically. And he does, he's a presence and he's amazing. And he's talented and he's, he is, and I know it's a trite word that people throw around, but he is a genius. And he has that genius mentality, like for sure. 
And so we met and we were talking and then walked out of the room. He wasn't even facing me and he said, let's do this. And then I was like, I think I got the job. I didn't even know like that was the job offer. So when his wife had called me afterwards, she was like, that's the job offer. And I was like, okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So, but that was tremendous boot camp because you first, you think, you know, cause I was a very, very diligent assistant designer. Like the, like uh, the designers could count on me through thick and thin. And if something was, let's say I had to step up, like there was, there was no issues there. I always took my job extremely, extremely seriously and love what I do, but there is no difference between doing that and then actually doing it. And you're the one in charge and then doing it for somebody like David Fincher. It was, I call it boot camp. Like it was like extreme and he's extreme and he's very, very serious and nothing gets left on set. Like he will, he will go down to the 18th of an inch, which I don't even know what that is in the <laughs> like a 30 second. Like it's like so insane, like what his detailed mind sees. So mm. yeah, it was incredible. He's one of uh, those people that actually deserved the from the visionary mind title. Yeah. <laughs> Was he very hands on and did he give you a lot of um, like input regarding costume design or did he kind of let you, you know, have the reins on it? Yes, he was very hands on. Um, he's extremely hands on in general. And uh, some people don't really know his tie to Mindhunter, but basically he was the showrunner, but he would never go by the term showrunner. Um, so he directed, I think, four of the episodes in the first season <clears throat> and then I think two or three or four in the second season but he was there every day he was the person I showed every single fitting photo to including every single background fitting photo to he was the person he was my go-to person for approvals throughout the whole thing he would do um he would do a lot of reshoots that the other directors couldn't do it so he basically directed almost both seasons <clears throat> he was very hands-on my first meeting with him I, I had I had gone in, it was 1977, so I had gone in, and even though it was, but it was FBI, it was Quantico, it was Virginia, if FBI looks the same in 1977 as they do today. So you, you know, you're like working with tie shapes and silhouettes of suits and very, very just subtle changes because basically a Brooks Brothers suit still looks the same 45 years later. Um, and I had, of course, wanted to enthuse a lot of 70s into it, and he was like, absolutely not. Like, so he was like, you know, as much as he does all these period shows, he has a very restrained vision of periods. If you go back and watch his movies, even like mm -hmm. Zodiac, it's, I, he doesn't like to distract from the overall content, and he has such a vibe mm -hmm. that that's what you kind of took away. So, like, my version of 70s was mostly based on silhouette it was definitely just serving the scripts and then the overall vision with the director of photography and the production designer and like just kind of setting up a sense of space so that you were listening to that content because it's such a heavy show and it's such serious like you really have to follow that dialogue as they're speaking to figure out what they're talking about so there was really no very little distractions especially no in, um, additional input of like hair and makeup that would throw it over the top to the 70s like just subtle things like that if you kind of Think about Mindhunter, it's just very, very restrained. Yeah. On that, how closely do you work at like in the costume department with hair and makeup? Because you are kind of making this entire look. Yeah, you work very closely. The costume designer essentially is is in charge of hair and makeup, for lack of a better purpose. Um, like hair and makeup know that we're going to work together mm -hmm. and you're going to provide the overall image. So, I mean, traditionally, you would always do the fittings first or the costume look first. And then you would go over and you'd meet with hair and makeup and discuss looks. Sometimes you may have an exact idea like oh they have to wear a bun in this scene or something or like you know a high ponytail and sometimes it's just the two of you working it out but you always work together you always send your fitting photos and a breakdown to hair and makeup so they know what they're wearing so that everybody works symbolic mm -hmm. that's you know just working together and then with um bill and ted face the music how was your approach um, to start designing that and what, what was your first steps in that process? Oh, well, Bill and Ted was so exciting for me because just to jump off of Mindhunter, we were currently doing Mindhunter reshoots when I got the script for Bill and Ted. And so I could not have been more excited because I'd been now been doing Mindhunter for like over a year, like a year and a few months. 
to get out of such serious content. So when I got the script for Bill and Ted, I was like, oh, I can breathe again. Like it was such a sigh of relief. Like, like there's something light in the world. And um, what I normally do is when I receive a script, um, I read the script. I just read it as is. I'm like, okay, you take me on the journey. Like the written word is first. Like, let's see where this goes. And I don't have any expectations for any scripts going into it. And um, by the end, when I finished Bill and Ted Face Music, I was like, I had the biggest smile on my face and it was plastered on my face. And I responded back to the producer and I was like, I have the biggest smile on my face. I would love to meet for this project. Um, then my next step is I read it again and start making my notes. And then I start gathering my images and my ideas and stuff to present to the director. Um, and then with that, you know, I usually just go on board. The next step is now the director's input. The director, he needs to give you direction. Um, so, but for that, so I had my interview process and Dean Pariso is the director who's amazing. We just, we just kind of hit it off. He was like, this is, this is what I'm thinking too. And, um, and that's how it works. So I had then gone off and then you start developing those original ideas with the director's input a little bit further. But in particular for Bill and Ted, you know, it's a, it's a cult film. It's a franchise. Mm -hmm. It's Keanu Reeves and Alex Winter. It's people have this, this vision of Bill and Ted. And so nobody had more input in it than Keanu and Alex. And even the director, Dean, was like, defer to them. No one's going to know Bill and Ted more than Keanu and Alex. So that was my next step, is to, was to go meet with Keanu and Alex and be like, OK, here's what I'm thinking. What are you thinking? So. And that went a few different ways because Alex, they both have a completely different process. They're both completely different people. And, um, and they're, I mean, they're really good friends from working together all these years, but you know, Alex already kind of knew what he wanted to look like. It wasn't far off from what you think of Bill. Keanu had just got off John Wick and was going to go do a big John Wick press tour. So he was like, I don't know what I want to wear. Maybe I want to wear a kilt. And we're like, yes, wear a kilt. Like we were like so excited. And then like within like moments, he was like, I'm not wearing a kilt. So, um, but we really did try to make him wear a kilt for quite a while. So, and then I think, you know, partially maybe because he's, he's very comfortable in a suit at this point in his life. I'm not too sure or what, but he was like, I would like to wear a suit. And so, which is kind of exciting for me because I was like, okay, why would you wear a suit? What kind of a suit would you wear? And you know, let's make the suit where it makes sense. So he thought he might wear a Donna suit when he went to go to the therapist office, the couple's therapist office. And he wanted to be a light, light gray. He was very specific. I had like the stacks of swatches, I can't even tell you. Like he like went through and combed them all. He was like, this is the gray. And it kind of just, we went from there and okay, well, can I make, you know, there's gotta be something kind of sporty in there because he's Ted. So it was uh, like a definitely, it's like more of a surfer, you know, button front shirt with it. And, and just like, how does the suit fit? And like, let's go from there and make it more Ted. So that's how the input went for those two guys, for sure. Mm. It was fun. Yeah. Bill and Ted is obviously also, it's very 80s, but I still feel like you really managed to embody that vibe without, again, overtaking it. Um, it's just like a nice subtlety, uh, a nice energy, but it wasn't like you wouldn't say, oh, it's just nostalgia. It's just a gimmick. Like it didn't work like that. It went really nice and well with it. Now, obviously, with Bill and Ted, it's also almost like a one off outfit, right? Like it's the entire it's the same outfit for the entire movie. So was that challenging or a bit like, wow, I have like this has to be the right outfit because people are going to look at this for the entire movie? Oh, absolutely. That would be the biggest challenge if people was to ask me because it is like it is essentially a one costume show. So that costume needs to say everything and also needs to be pleasing to the audience's eye because they need to watch that costume for i yeah you wanted to make sure it, it just ticked off all the boxes for all the right reasons and yeah. for my personal style like i i grew up watching those films in the theaters so <laughs> you ladies are much younger but like they were a part of my life I was a fan I wasn't a fanatic but I definitely was a fan and watched both of them in the theater and kind of probably didn't watch them since and that was actually the last thing I did before I went to go meet with the director I had that script stood alone on its own like you said it's a very good third installment like you could just pick up that script it didn't need to really carry on to the past and 
neither Bill, neither Keanu or Alex wanted to be stuck in time. Like they were like, we're 30 years older. The characters are 30 years older. Like we want to, we want it to look like 30 years has passed by. What have we done those 30 years? We thought we were going to be successful musicians. We are not. So let's pick up from there. So it was important to include all of that. But mm -hmm. um, I think then what was maybe originally channeled from the Bill and Ted went to the daughters, like all mm -hmm. that irreverence and the effervescence that you wanted to maybe like kind of embody got channeled into the daughters and their costumes, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> all the projects, go on, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Out of all the projects you've worked on, do you have maybe one, like a favorite? I know that's hard to pick, but would you say you preferred one process over another? Well, I have, so I transitioned to costume designing about five years ago, and, and believe it or not, most of that time was Mindhunter, because Mindhunter were very, very long chunks of time, like one was a year and a half, the other one was a year and a few months, um, and then I went on to do Bill and Ted, and then I'm, I immediately afterwards designed a third film that will come out next, they say next spring, I'll see what happens, um, and that was directed by a female director, Lisa Joy, who's just so amazing. And her, she's known for Westworld. Her and her husband produce and write and, and have directed some of Westworld. Mm. And that's a, like a neo-noir, like a sci-fi neo-noir with Ooh. this Ooh. horrible cast, you know, Hugh Jackman and Rebecca Ferguson and Tandy Newton, just this, you know, whatever. And so for me, like, I think what I, I've loved about my, my costume design career so far is everything has been very different. I got to do Mindhunter, which is a very serious, restrained period piece. And then I got to do Bill and Ted, which is very fun and light and frothy. And then I've, now my next one was gonna be this neo-noir, which is kind of more classic elements of a noir film. And like kind of just twisted on, on, you know, just turned up the volume a little bit. So I love all of those and I can't wait to see what happens next for me. But prior to that, when I was costuming and mostly system designing, I have, I always say these two things without a doubt. I love, I worked with Nancy Steiner, who was a costume designer for like nine years. And my favorite film I could watch again and again and again is Little Miss Sunshine. Mm. And my second thing that I worked on because I was a Twin Peaks, I was a Twin Peaks fanatic. I, I'm like a Twin Peaks nerd was I worked on Twin Peaks with Nancy Steiner also. And that's definitely putting something out into the universe. When I heard Twin Peaks was coming back, I'm like, I'm working on that. And then she called me like two days later. Like, I, all you have to do sometimes is put it out there and it happens. She was like, I just got a job and I heard you were a fan. I'm like, you got Twin Peaks. Like, I already knew what it was, so. And that was, that was a serious pinch me moment to go to work every day. That's when I really remembered why I like doing what I do. Like, mm. to get to go to work every day and watch David Lynch direct was just, like, still gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um could you just give me one second because it says my internet connection is a bit unstable so i'm just gonna go plug the ethernet cable in but shana you can just ask a question if you want in the meantime yeah, sure. um okay well i do have another question for you um out of all films ever made is there one specific um costume design in a film that you wish you worked on and you're like oh you know, I wish I did that instead of that other person. Oh, that's a really good question and almost impossible to answer. I, my very, very, very favorite film, I actually have an answer for that, is Rear Window, Alfred yes. Hitchcock's Rear Window. And the costumes in that are insane. And I, I just, but I just absolutely adore that movie for all the reasons. I just think it's a, just one of my favorite films. So perhaps I could still answer with that to want to also costume design it because there are some moments in there of her co her clothing, Grace Kelly's clothing that are just like still breathtaking to this day. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll leave with that and not overthink it because I'll probably come up with like 20 other projects. <laughs> so there was a challenge a couple years ago and it was like 10 films that influenced you. Do you, do, with the, on um, Instagram, do you remember? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I think yeah, I've seen that. that. Mm. Yeah, and I had, um, partook in that and it was uh it was it was difficult like just to narrow it down to 10 and a lot of times I would I would put two up there because you know maybe you were influenced but maybe it's like Auntie Mame where it's just somebody that's like so fabulous but like Harold and Maude is also just as equally as fabulous for a badass woman like it's hard to like pick which one in there you know so mm -hmm. 
we'll save your window. Yeah. So obviously I think with costume design, mostly when people think about it, they might think more about the like very, uh, not outrageous, but the very dramatic outfits, you know, period dresses and big sci-fi outfits and stuff like that. But there's also something really important about creating the more n normal outfits, the more down to earth outfits, because you still find character in there. Is there, how do you feel about that? What's your favorite parts about designing these clothes? Yes, absolutely. I think that, um, I think uh, Sandy Powell, who do you know who she is? She's like one of the most incredible living legends of a costume designer who has won several awards, several Academy Awards, and mostly works with Martin Scorsese. She accepted one of her Oscars and was like, almost at that point, she was like, here's my other Oscar, but everyone forgets about the contemporary work because it's absolutely true. I feel like because we all dress, and it's a common, it's a common uh, process challenge working with producers too, because they assume I get up and put on clothes, so how hard can it be? Um, yeah, if you do it correctly, there's a lot of thought that goes behind even someone just being very simple dressed. Um, your first thought is the character and serving the character. And that obviously comes with um, reading the script and then meeting with the director and it's a lot of collabor collaboration with the director, the cast, your, your own, obviously lots of your own personal ideas and, and the, how that dynamic works together for sure. Um, and uh, something like with Bill and Ted, bring it back to Bill and Ted really quick would be that it spanned time. It was like, there's like Paleolithic cave people all to like the future and maybe people would assume there's a big budget on Bill and Ted, but there wasn't. So, and that's a common thing you're going to hear everyone say, oh, I never had enough money. But like, there truly was a huge budget constraint. So my approach was a little bit of a concern to the audience's eye, because now we're so used to seeing these Marvel films. So, like, if you think of the future, you think of this, like, amazing build and, like, superhero type things. And, and I know how long it takes to make those and how much money those costumes cost. So I was like, okay, well, you've got a robot, you've got the future, but we have to do our own version of it that can tie into the movie, still serve its purpose, but also look elevated and fun and just be the best it can be. And along with the historical clothing too, because you now see these immaculate period pieces and it's people want to tear apart if it's not accurate, uh, you know, down to the T, down to the kind of ribbon they use. I could just hear these costume designers always like picking things apart. So it's like, okay, that was actually one of my more daunting things was like, I have to do all these like period costumes. I don't want them to look hokey or do I? Maybe I just lean into that silliness because the movie is so lighthearted. Like basically the, I love Bill and Ted so much because it's such a heartfelt warm movie. Like you, I love the movie because it's so sweet. So um, all of those are challenges and all those are challenges within your time constraint and your budget for sure. So I think adding all that together and just maybe doing or just doing somebody that just is an everyday costume you know what are you bringing to the table for that like there's got to be something in there of why that person just has a t-shirt and jeans on you know otherwise kind of you shouldn't be doing it <laughs> so yeah and i know you previously said that your most recent work was um the, the most recent film you worked on was directed by a woman i'm wondering what is your experience regarding you know, women representation in film? Because um, you know every single person we have on has a different experience, so I'd just like to hear yours. Especially since costume designing is one of the few that are majority female. Majority female, and um, yeah, I feel, so I've been doing costumes for over 20 years, and I definitely feel as though you're seeing more female representation. Um, Definitely more female directors would be the most common thing. Common saying, I don't even know what that would be. Like maybe there's probably like 5% that are female directors if you looked it up, don't, don't quote me on that, but I know it's very low. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to see, you know, there's a lot of departments that are definitely male, like male dominated. Like it would, it's rare to see a female director of photography or something like that. All of these, these things with toys in it, you know, it's like, I would like to, it's when you see a female DP, you're like, whoa, like th then you're like taken aback. Like you're like, okay, now it's happening. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to grow. I sort of had hoped 
you know, with the pandemic this year and so much reflection and growth that people had, and it was personal and it was outspoken. I thought it was going to be more like the Phoenix rising from the ashes and like every first thing that was greenlit was going to be like some BIPOC, like, you know, just mm -hmm. female run thing. That sort of, I don't think has happened. <laughs> so we'll wait and see for that. But um, like the first few inquiries I had, I was like, oh, it's two male leads and it's directed by a man. Like I just sort of thought maybe it would be like in my face more. Um, and not that I need to see a thousand BIPOC stories, but for me, I think it would be nicer just to see different people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think we need to start implementing what people actually look like so that that's, you're like, so it's not like, oh my gosh, that person is a bigger girl. I think people should be like, I know that person because that is an actual person, you know? It can't be like, aren't they amazing? That's a big girl they cast. I feel like it could be anything for that mm -hmm. matter. Just so it just becomes normal. Like your group of friends is a whole different color of friends, you know? So it doesn't need to be like every single story needs to be um, a horrible part of their life. I think it would be nice just to see people just, just working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to female and film. So I loved working with Lisa. Lisa was, every single director has their own communication skills, I want to say. Some of them are excellent at verbalizing. Some of them are excellent at just sharing images in order to convey what they would like. And some of them are maybe better at saying what they don't like. Like maybe you'll present something and they'd be like, I don't like this, maybe more like this. And I, I'm happy with any of those. As long as you're communicating, collaborating, moving forward, I think that's great. Lisa could do like all of that and direct and, and, and like do it in heels backwards, as they say. Like she was just this amazing talent. And she would kind of, I think, kind of like self-deprecate and be like, well, I don't know anything about fashion, but she knew everything about fashion. So she like had a lot of input of what she visually liked and wanted to see and and excellent input too. Like, here, like she'd be like, this is sex. Like I might think something sexy and she might think something different is completely sexy. And she was like, this is the direction I'd like us to go in. So. It was, it was great. And she was, and that doesn't mean that every single female director is this way, but she was just very warm and generous with her direction. Mm. Yeah. Another thing, like, have you ever maybe been asked to make a costume that you didn't really feel comfortable with making? Cause I know with, especially women, a lot of the costumes are ridiculously revealing. Um, have you ever had such an experience? I, uh, I'm going to say offhand, personally, no, um, cause I definitely, I think maybe perhaps because I was on the other side for so long in assisting and I would mm -hmm. see a lot of the, behind the, maybe the costume designers interactions a lot more. Um, I just think you definitely want the actor to be comfortable and comfortable is a maybe not the right term, but you want the comf you want the actor to know that that costume is right because it will, their acting will suffer. So if they put on something they don't like, it will suffer. It also could backlash on you on the day. Like they could be like, I'm not wearing this and like camera's waiting, you know? So for me, the process pr prior to that is like very well, like, are you happy in this? Do you feel comfortable in this? Like, let's go forward from this and then elevating everything from there. Um, yes, I think, there's definitely some costumes that have been made where you're thinking, is this right? Um, but, uh, but I can't think of anything specific offhand. Like I, th I can think of maybe some things of other things I worked on that you were like, I know they're not crazy about this, but it seems to be moving forward and that kind of stuff happens a lot too. Mm -hmm. So um, that would be definitely more of like rethinking of behind the scenes. Nothing ever was like, I'm not wearing that. And then someone was like stomping their feet going like, you're putting this on. And like, you know, like I'm getting the producer involved. Like it's nothing like that. So. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I guess it's a good thing that you don't really um, have that many of those. Um, turning back over to something more positive. What would you say is generally like your favorite part about your job? What is it that just keeps you going, wanting to continue to create these? <laughs> That's another good question. Like, what is it? Um, I think it's, I'm definitely a worker bee. I have like a very, very strong ethic of, of for work. Um, and 
you know, right now I'm not currently working on something, but like my day to day life has to be like very busy and like very like puttering around, which is nothing compared to when you're actually working. Um, so I think if, you know, to do costumes and do films, it is such, it's like 200% of your time. Like it's a ridiculous amount of time you give up to go work on it. A common work week is 90 hours. I mean, it's, there's so much that falls to the wayside. Like, so at first, like when the pandemic happened, I was like, gosh, I've, this is so strange to like connect with people. <laughs> like actually talk to friends I haven't spoken to. Now it's gone on too long and we're, we're in a big mess. But um, I just think that working it comes naturally to me. I always knew I was gonna be working with something creative with clothing. Um, I think taking that approach to how much joy I can try to have in my day-to-day -day life as I'm working is very important um, and kind of work from a higher frequency. And my favorite part, my very favorite part is when you start to collect the ideas and start putting together all your boards and you just feel like at that moment, you're like, I can do anything, like the whole world's a oyster. And then you start getting that input and everything <laughs> kind of starts to change. But, um, and even then it's sort of, I take if someone, I don't take any criticism back because it's sort of like, okay, I'm a creative person. We're in a creative field. How can I creatively fix this? It's like, how can I move forward in like the best way possible? So. Mm. Yeah. I know that a lot of our listeners are probably more aspiring in the writer, director, producer field, but that doesn't mean that you should underestimate the costume department at all. Is there anything that you would like to say to people who are aspiring to, you know, be the creator and then might maybe not, you know, uh, or maybe not really thinking about all the other different departments that really, uh, are, you know, are a part of this whole production? I think that you definitely need to follow whatever you want to be in. If they're gonna be a writer, if they wanna be a writer or director or producer, that's what you have to do. Because like I said, it requires so much of your time and energy and you do miss out on other day-to-day -day things in life. However, I would definitely say it would be amazing. And I hardly come across this. People get their jobs all different ways. If they could take a production design, a production assistant job in costumes or art department, something where it's one of those fields, just so they get a taste of what you actually are doing. I think that would be so much more beneficial to maybe their overall career because they would really understand what it takes. You never know the process until you're actually doing it. So every once in a while, it's just very interesting if you, if I talk to somebody and they're like, oh yeah, I PA'd once in the costume shop. And you were like, what'd you think? They're like, I will never ever <laughs> underestimate what you do again. Like, Cause that is what people, that's usually the take from it. Like they can't believe how much work goes into it. And they would have never imagined until they're, they're doing it or just watching it happen. And it's very rare that a director really, truly, truly, truly is that observant, like really actually knows what's going on. So um, that's a very rare person because you have to have a different set of I mean to direct obviously I can't even imagine how daunting that is you're in charge of the whole thing so if you're the kind of person that really has stepped back and really paid attention to what your crew is doing that's an exceptional that's an exceptional person yeah and lastly since this podcast is all about female empowerment we always like to ask our guests if there's any woman in your life whether personal or professional that have inspired you at all oh my goodness oh my goodness that is that's a that's a loaded question yes well i have to say my mother obviously because my mother is actually an extremely creative person and it's totally witty and totally off the charts and um and you know she would just dress and like come to garçon to go get the mail like she just is like a very interesting person so i would be remiss not to start with my mom and then i probably would have to go on to like a whole laundry list of like female people that have inspired you throughout the years and that could be anything from like betsy johnson and like cindy lopper to you know like i you know, all these current people that are actually doing like social justice things today like you know if you are like or just female politicians like AOC and Michelle Obama like there's so many things that inspire you throughout the your life it's just it's unbelievable but mom I think mom's the the stone the cornerstone <laughs> through it all yeah 
Everyone says their mom. Everyone says their mom. Gosh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and is there anything, oh, I guess, what would be the first advice you'd give to anyone who might be like, I really want to get into costume designing, especially maybe now in COVID times where you can't really make those costumes or build your portfolio the same way. Is there any advice you might have? Yes, it is. Uh, especially, <laughs> I, I don't know because I'm trying to navigate how to work right now myself. Mm. Um, and it's very strange out there right now. It's actually very busy. And uh, I don't know how to answer to that because there's mm -hmm. also not a lot of projects going on. And then maybe it's a combination of people already, maybe there's a combination of people that are not working right now on purpose. So it's just busy enough to keep people that want to work busy. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to people to, to answer that for the current times, but I would like to say just persevere and definitely, you know, just try to connect with people. Um, I had a very close friend of mine. It's sort of like his second career now. He went back to school and, and studied fashion and theater. And he's like a good friend of mine. And I didn't realize until all of a sudden he was talking the other day. He was like, I love Ryan Murphy projects. And I was like, Wait, you've never mentioned that before. I can connect you to the person that designs all of those projects. So I also think that, you know, and he, you know, for a PA job to start from the ground up, like he, he's not expecting anything at all. And um, when I reached out to let her know, she was like, this is amazing. I have all these projects. I could probably totally use this person's help. So I think like letting yourself be heard and, and telling people what you like in a very polite professional way or just, you know, unexpectedly. I was very reserved for like the first 10 years of my career, even though I always wanted to design, I never told people. And then I remember I just was like in the trailer one day with this person and she was like, you should be letting people you know what you want to do because then that's what they'll hire you for. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I just thought I would be respectful and quiet. Yeah. Um, so I think, and I've had people reach out to me and I'm not one for chit chat. And if they reach out a second time, they're like, I would love to meet with you via Zoom. It's like, I should take that opportunity because you really just never know where the next, next person is that you're going to connect with. Mm -hmm. And because it is so busy, a lot of people that work all the time, they work all the time. So you do need to set up new people and network with new people and really just need to find new talent, whatever their age is. It does, they don't have to be just recent graduates. It can be whatever they want to do. So that would be my thing. I, my second thing would be to um, just, you know, basically keep on it. As just know something's out there and like you have to trust the process because that the timing and the process is different for everyone so it's and that's a very difficult thing and coming from a few different generations from from where you guys are you know there seems to be there's always that like you want this immediate gratification and this and that and it's you definitely some people need to take their own trajectory and that could be slower than they anticipated. Like I thought I was going to graduate from university and work with Carl Lagerfeld. You know what I mean? Like everybody has their own like version of like, you know, like that summer. Like I was like, and then he's going to hire me and I'll live in Paris. Like, you know, I just think everybody like expects something in their life. And sometimes you really, really, really need to work for it. You heard it. <laughs> you heard yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you want to plug or promote? Uh, where can people find you? Oh, I have a, um, on my Instagram at Jen Starzik and I have a website at jenniferstarzik.com. So that would be the best place to find me. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And yeah. everyone uh, go watch Bill and Ted. It's, I think it's playing in some theaters, but you can also rent it on Amazon. So yeah. All right. This has been